So this is gonna be my last video in this series, at least for a while, and I thought I would end it with a very central idea in Christianity, the idea that not only did Jesus die, but he also rose again. This is not, not how I imagined my resurrection news to break. You know, Christ told me the secret to the resurrection once. We were at this wedding in Cana, right? It was not the resurrection. It is hardly a miracle. One of them first-class tickets to the resurrection. All stories are about death and resurrection. Hey everybody, thank you so much for being so awesome. Thank you for liking and subscribing and commenting and all the other wonderful stuff you do because of course, you're wonderful people. I put the links down below for the social media, for the Patreon, for the merch, for uh, uh, if you just wanna hang out with me. I love coffee. If there's one thing people know about me. Yeah, it's that I like coffee. And this is cold brew coffee because it is a hot summer day. And you know what? You know where I got this cold brew? I made it. Made it myself with a kit that I got from Bespoke Post. It comes with all this awesome stuff like this cold brew iced coffee maker from Primella. It comes with a concrete desk set, which is looking really good with my coffee setup. It comes with these Bolivar bitters, which taste really great in the coffee. Or if you're a cocktail person, you can use it in there. And uh, it's just frigging awesome. Um, and I've been using it a lot. And um, I will be using it all summer long and honestly, probably into the winter. They also sent me this forge knife, which is really awesome. I'm going camping in a couple weeks, so this is going to come in very much handy uh, for cutting things like sticks to roast marshmallows, as well as I've been using it around the house for opening boxes when I get a delivery, or things like eating a slice of this juicy apple. Hey, uh, Trevor, don't eat in the ads. Nobody's going to enjoy that. So the forge is the Damascus steel knife. Look at that. That is amazing. It is uh, made by Bare Bones, based in Salt Lake City. And you know why? 90% of the products they have come from small brands, many of which are based right in the U.S. of A. Bespoke Post is a monthly membership club delivering a box of awesome Top shelf goods from under the radar brands. It's free to join and you can skip a month or cancel any time. Every month we introduce our members to cool new products, outdoor gear, barware, home and kitchen goods, clothing and more. Even live oysters. Based on a preference quiz they fill out. Every box of awesome has around $70 worth of goods inside but costs you only a fraction of the value. Preview your box before it ships, and you'll get a box of awesome assigned to you. And before it's shipped, you'll get a preview of what comes inside to decide if one, keep it, two, swap it for a different box, three, skip the month entirely for no charge. You only pay for what you want. And their box lineup is constantly changing every single month. To get 20% off your first box of awesome, click the link in the description and enter Believe It or Not 20 at checkout or go to bespokepost.com slash Believe It or Not 20. The resurrection is quite important to Christianity. Now, as I began that investigation, one thing became very clear very quickly. And that is, if you want to, if you want to determine once and for all, is Christianity true and therefore every other contrary faith system in the world false? If you want to get to that bottom line, all you have to do is answer one question. Here's the question. Did Jesus or did he not return from the dead? That's the ball game. Why? You don't disprove Christianity by pointing out some sort of alleged error or contradiction in the Bible. The way you disprove Christianity is by proving that one event in human history that changed and revolutionized all of human history did not occur, and that one event is none other than the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If you can disprove that, then you have disproven Christianity. 
I'm accused all the time of trying to disprove Christianity. There are people who think that that's what this channel is all about. And I don't see it that way at all. That wasn't my goal when I started doing this, and that hasn't become my goal since. My number one goal is to let people who are leaving a religion, thinking about leaving religion, or have left their religion, know that it's okay, and they are not alone, and that it's okay to question things. I mostly stick to evangelical Christianity because that is my history and that is what I can best speak to. Questioning a claim is very different than trying to disprove something. Because with any claim, but especially claims of the supernatural, it's not up to the person being told the claim to disprove it. It's up to the person making the claim to prove it. For instance, if somebody tells you that they have a horse in their stable, you know that they have a ranch, you know that it fits into their income to get a horse, and you know that they've been wanting to get a horse for a while, you're probably going to just believe them at face value. Maybe you'll want to see the horse, but that's just because horses are pretty and you want to see that horse. But if that same person tells you that they have a Pegasus in their stable, You'll want some evidence for that claim before you believe them. Luckily, there are many videos out there of pastors, theologians, and apologists talking about the evidence that exists for the resurrection of Jesus. That the evidence for the New Testament being true is very good, particularly being true about one event from the ancient world. What's that event? The resurrection. Because if Jesus rose from the dead, Game over, Christianity is true. Of course, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, game over, it's false. You might as well sleep in on Sunday. Well, you guys are up on Saturday, it doesn't matter. And do what you want the rest of the week, because if God doesn't exist and Jesus didn't rise from the dead, Christianity is false. So I'll let them speak and then respond with whether or not I find the argument convincing. And on the off chance that I don't find it convincing, I'll let you know why I'm not convinced by that argument. Think of it like we're in a courtroom, and you are the jury deciding if there is enough evidence to convict Jesus of being guilty of resurrecting. That all being said, let's have a look at the evidence. Normally I'd say, hey, hit me with your best argument first, but... Um, Let's start with the worst argument and get that out of the way. Present your evidence, Cornelius. The Shroud of Turin. Even this guy will say that he's not 100% convinced, but he does find it compelling. But the most interesting thing about the Shroud is there's real blood on it. Well, they aren't 100% sure that it's not blood. They do know, though, that the blood splatter is very inconsistent with the way that blood would act if it came from somebody lying down and suggests more that it was sprinkled on top or splattered from on top. There's a body image. There are hundreds of burial garments in existence. None have body images like this. Body images that are way different than normal human body proportions and positioned in a way to cover up the genitals for modesty, which would not have been how they would wrap them in the day, and seems more to be an artistic choice. And you don't want to display Jesus' junk all over the world. There's a body image on it, and according to a recent uh, scientific, uh, let's say, conference, in Washington, state of Washington, um, every scientist, over a dozen, who responded to the comment of what is the image on the shroud made of, they all, I understand, all came to the conclusion that the image on the shroud is because of radiation from the dead crucified body underneath. No, there are questions about how the image was placed on the cloth, but that doesn't mean that there is an overwhelming consensus. Tests have shown that just because there is no pigmentation now doesn't mean there never was. Meaning that wear and tear over time may have removed the pigmentation, but because it was there at one point, there is a difference in appearance to the other parts of the cloth. So the man is crucified, has virtually all the marks associated with death by, death by crucifixion of Jesus in the New Testament. A cloth that is dated between 1260 to 1390 because of carbon dating and by the fact that the type of cloth used would not have been used until this era. Not to mention that the Gospel of John says that there was one cloth for Christ's head and the rest was wrapped in strips. 
It was found to be a forgery almost immediately after its discovery. In 1390, a Catholic bishop said that it was a clever sleight of hand. This isn't physical evidence for a resurrected body. This is an art piece from the Middle Ages. Thank you. Next. The historical reliability of the burial narrative supports the empty tomb. Now you might ask, well, how is it that the reliability of the burial account of Jesus supports the historicity of his empty tomb? Well, very simply, in the following way. If the burial account is accurate, then the site of Jesus' grave was known in Jerusalem to both Jew and Christian alike. But in that case, it's a very short inference to the historicity of the empty tomb. For if Jesus had not been raised from the dead and the site of the grave were known, then in the first place, the disciples could never have believed in the resurrection of Jesus. The site of Jesus' tomb was known to Christians and non-Christians alike. He said, if it were not empty, it would have been highly unlikely for a movement based on the resurrection to have exploded into existence in the very same city where Jesus had been crucified just a few weeks before. Yeah, that's a pretty good argument, right? Yeah, that's pretty good. But we got more. But most people didn't convert to Christianity at the time. Judaism still exists, and most Christians aren't Jewish. It found its success when it expanded out past Jerusalem, where people could believe the stories. We see new religions pop up all the time, and there are always ways to refute their claims. But new religions are really good at recruiting people who will follow them no matter what. Earliest Jewish polemic presupposes the empty tomb. In the 28th chapter of Matthew's Gospel, we find the Christian attempt to refute the earliest Jewish polemic against the disciples' proclamation of the resurrection. Now, what were Jews saying in response to the disciples' proclamation, he is risen from the dead, that uh, his body still lay in the tomb? Uh, that these men were full of new wine? No, they were saying the disciples came and stole away his body. Said was, oh, well, um, the disciples stole the body. Now think about that. They're implicitly conceding the tomb is empty. They're trying to explain how it got empty. See what I'm saying? It's like if you're a teacher and a student comes up to you and says, the dog ate my homework. That student's admitting, look, I don't have my homework, but I can explain what happened to it. The dog ate it. It's the same thing. It's a cover story. They're conceding the tomb is empty. They're trying to explain how did it get empty while well, the disciples stole the body. Yeah, that's the response in the book. The Bible says that that was the response. It could simply be a narrative device to explain why people didn't believe it at the time and the reader is only hearing about it now decades later. It's a way to respond to, but if a guy rose from the dead, why am I just hearing about it now? Well, because people made excuses as to why the grave was empty. But even if it wasn't that way, even if you could prove an empty tomb, that doesn't prove a resurrection. As early as the New Testament, all the way to this present day, there have been attacks on the notion that Jesus was raised from the dead. And through the next almost 2,000 years, if we were to come up to today, there are a series of what we call counter theories to the resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus through the centuries has responded to these counter theories, such as, well, his body was stolen, or maybe he wasn't really dead when he was put in the tomb, and so on, have been responded to powerfully such that I'm convinced today the very best answer is, in fact, rationally that Jesus was historically raised from the dead. The apparent death theory. According to this theory, Jesus did not really die on the cross, but he was taken down alive and placed in the tomb where he revived and somehow escaped to convince the disciples that he had risen from the dead. This apparent death theory was championed by late 18th, early 19th century German rationalists and uh, unfortunately was even embraced by the father of modern theology, F.D.E. Schleiermacher. 
Slyamaka said that? Aw, oh, what a guy. Today, however, uh, the theory has been virtually entirely given up, and I think it's one of the virtues of Mel Gibson's movie that anyone who has seen that film and the suffering that Jesus of Nazareth endured would realize the patent absurdity of the apparent death theory. Well, I guess Mel Gibson is good for something then. In the 1700s, they used to put a bell outside of a grave with a string leading into the coffin, so if they woke up and weren't actually dead, they could ring the bell. I'm not saying that this is definitely what happened and that he was only mostly dead or whatever. Well, it just so happens that your friend here is only mostly dead. But it is an example of something that we know has and can happen, unlike resurrections. E.T. from home. But apologists spend so much time trying to disprove each theory about why the tomb may have been empty. So the guy who has the Pegasus in his stable, if he said, if I didn't have a Pegasus, how did I get the weather vane on the roof? And if you say, well, you could have used a ladder. And then he goes on to prove that he's never owned a ladder. That in no way proves that he owns a Pegasus that flew him to the top of his house. What do you think people did before ladders? Were they, was it just like, well, I can't fix that shit. Next! <laughs> what is the body of proof? I believe Jesus rose from the grave because it's the only way we ultimately make sense of the suffering in our lives. You know, Alan, you and I have this opportunity to minister to a lot of people. There are people that watch your program from all over the world. There's probably not a time uh, in the day that someone's not watching one of your videos. And you probably have received, like I have, many messages from people who are hurting. They need help. They wonder, what's life all about? We live in an age where now society has fallen into despair. And people wonder, what's the point of life anyways? The resurrection of Jesus shows us why we as followers of Jesus are the people of hope, and we are the people who bring hope. You can almost substitute anything into that argument. Any religion, any mythology, any self-help book. Troy, this circle is you. My God, it's like you've known me all my life. You saying that it helps people put their suffering into context is no more evidence of the resurrection than saying that a trickster god is the reason you suffer, or because you got cursed by a witch when you stepped on her toe. Anything can happen in this world. We really know very little. Why does the resurrection make sense of the suffering around us? Because only Christianity makes, the worldview of Christianity is the only thing that makes sense in the world around us. There is no hope. Alan, I find myself like, like Peter and the other disciples said, Lord, where are we going to go if we don't turn to you? Mm -hmm. There are no answers. According to secular humanism, the greatest competitor of Christianity, there's nothing special about you. You're an accident. There's not, you're not made, as Peter Singer said, you're not made in the image of God. There's nothing that differentiates you from roadkill. Mm, yeah. So which worldview do you think makes better sense of the world? Yeah. Say it with me, folks. Just because something is an answer doesn't mean it's the right answer. I think that there is a lot of hope without religion. I think that people matter regardless of how they got here. I don't need somebody to tell me a magical tale in order to see value in my fellow human being. There is suffering in this world because there is no all-powerful, all-loving, all-knowing being watching over us who can stop the suffering. There is suffering in this world because human beings need to look out for each other, and sometimes we fail hard at that. But that doesn't mean you give up hope. We've been waiting too long for a God to fix it when we should be well aware by now that it is up to us. Next! Three, his disciples believed that they were seeing Jesus after his resurrection, that is in a post-mortem raised state, so much so that they were willing to die for this. This is remarkable. All right, now you might say, wait a minute, Frank. You're gonna say that martyrdom proves Christianity. Don't you have to say that martyrdom proves Islam? No, why? Because there's a lot of differences between the Muslim martyrs of today and the New Testament martyrs of New Testament times. Let me just give you one difference for our purposes. The Muslim martyrs, haven't witnessed anything that tells them that Islam is true. They just have faith. But the New Testament martyrs saw Jesus rise from the dead. They touched Jesus. They ate with Jesus. 
they verified with their own senses that Jesus had risen from the dead. You see, some people will die for a lie they think is the truth. Nobody will die for a lie they know is a lie. Apostles who were the first eyewitnesses of this and record it were all willing to suffer and willing to die for this conviction. They touched him, they talked with him, they ate with him. They were in a position, unlike anybody else in history, they were in a position to know for a fact, is this true or is it a lie? And knowing it was true, they were willing to die for it. That tells me something about the veracity of their claims. I touched on this briefly in a video I did about the inerrancy of the Bible, and I mentioned that we don't really know the circumstances of the apostles' death. Many of the stories we know about the martyrdoms weren't created until like the third century, but there are some earlier claims, especially surrounding the death of Peter and Paul. At this point, we don't know how accurate those stories are, and we don't know the circumstances around their death. But either way, founders of religions die for their cause all the time. Look at Marshall Applewhite of the Heaven's Gates cult. He died for a religion he helped create. Does that mean his claims were true? Because it's a binary choice, right? Either he died for a lie or it was true. None of these guys are Mormon, despite knowing that Joseph Smith is considered a martyr in Mormonism. And it's quite easy to see that he made this religion up. Cult leaders die for their cults all the time because that power and control goes to their head to the point where they believe their own lies. They believe in what they are doing and they simply would rather die than to be seen as a fraud. The other thing is, maybe they actually believed in the message. Maybe they thought that the message of doing to others as you would have them do unto you and turning the other cheek or feeding the poor was a cause worth dying for in their minds, whether or not the story they were using to sell it was true or not. I, I love, I have a lot of fun with this. If the early church had a hashtag, it'd be hashtag on the third day. <laughs> By the way, if you don't know what a hashtag is, Alan and I in this channel, we cannot help you, ladies no, and gentlemen. there's no hope so, for you. <laughs> no hope. But there Jesus. is no hope, but Jesus. <laughs> that is so true. Listen, folks, if you don't know what a hashtag is, yeah, get get out of here. You know that thing that's been in the lexicon for like two decades? If you don't if you don't know that, you can just get off and get out of this place. The next That's Mama's girl. There's only two possibilities when it comes to the resurrection. He it either happened or it didn't happen. Right? You've confused possibilities with probabilities. According to your analogy, when I go home, I might find a million dollars on my bed, or I might not. If it happened, then Jesus is Lord. You've heard Lord Liar Lunatic, right? According to the Gospel of Matthew, he was just one of many people who were raised from the dead. Were they all the Lord? Okay, he's the Lord, okay? If it didn't happen, either the apostles, the New Testament writers lied, or what's the other option? They were deceived. They were mistaken, right? They thought he had resurrected from the dead and they wrote it down like they, and they went and died for it, but he didn't really die or he didn't really ri rise from the dead. Now, why are these two things implausible? Well, they had no motive to lie about the resurrection, as we've already pointed out, right? Because all they got, were, they were beaten, tortured, and killed for saying it was true. In fact, they had a big motive to deny the resurrection. They're Jews. They don't want to get kicked out of the temple. They don't want to be excommunicated. They don't want to be thrown out of the chosen people club. Why would they do this? In the last few years, we have seen families torn apart because people will believe things that are demonstrably not true, like vaccines are bad for you, despite science showing otherwise, or that the American election was stolen despite all the courts and all the evidence showing otherwise. Because people like to feel like they know something that everyone else doesn't. They like being part of something new and exciting. They like feeling like they are part of something bigger than themselves. Could they have been mistaken? Well, they had no expe uh, expectation of a resurrection. They weren't expecting a resurrection and then maybe saw him and assumed he had risen from the dead when he really hadn't. They weren't expecting it. And uh, if... They were mistaken. They could have easily been corrected by enemies showing Jesus's dead body. They could have just gone to the tomb and taken out Jesus's body 
and said, stop all this nonsense talk about the resurrection. He's dead. They didn't do that. Why? Because he wasn't dead. So, seems to me it really did happen, and this is the conclusion. Jesus is Lord, and if Jesus is Lord, then all we need to do is see what he wants us to do. So the options aren't either this guy has a Pegasus or this guy has a ladder because we have no reason to believe he has a Pegasus. There are many ways he could have put that weather vane on the roof. It is not a 50-50. We don't see resurrections. A resurrection is a supernatural occurrence, which we also don't see. Common objection I hear from atheists, and I do a lot of stuff online, Facebook and everything. And the, the one thing that they say that I see a lot is, any naturalistic explanation you can think of right. is going to be more probable. That's part of it. I mean, that's a lot of guys. Is that is, Why? is your response? No, that is, that is the subjection because what they're saying is disciples stole the body is a lousy objection, but it's better than yours because stolen bodies happen in this world. Resurrections don't. What he's saying is there's no another world. There's not another world from which Jesus was a strange visitor to this planet. Um, you know, to begin his missionary efforts on earth from his father's right hand. There's no other world. So when they say, uh, you know, any other theory is more logical, it's not because they're not saying what a lot of Christians think they are. They're not saying all of my theories have better evidence than yours. They're not. They're saying you got some data there, but you asked me to believe in a crazy place and people can rise from the dead and we don't have any other examples. So chances are you're wrong. And that's not to dismiss the possibility of a miracle happening. That just means we'll need evidence for miracles happening. However, this lingering skepticism about the gospel appearance narrative seems to me to be entirely unjustified. It is based upon a presuppositional bias toward the physicalism in the gospel appearance stories. Jesus appears bodily and physically alive from the dead. And since many New Testament critics uh, retain the presupposition of the impossibility of nature miracles, these stories are written off as legendary accretions simply on the basis of that philosophical prejudice against the possibility of nature miracles. Yeah, we tend to not believe things that there has not been evidence for. Another common a comment is, yeah, but you got a problem with your theory. What's that? Well, you got some data for your theory, and I'm not exactly sure where I would go to refute it, but you're asking me, implicit in your argument, is you're asking me to believe in Middle Earth, Narnia, or if you want a secular example, Oz. You're asking me to believe in that, and there's no world like that. How do you know? Well, there's no, you know, look, everything we know from empirical science, there's not an ultimate universe. And when I'm talking to a person like that, I always go, time out. Let's talk about near-death experiences. Do not let your imagination run out of control. Well, that's easy for you to say. You have a bad imagination. It's stupid. I live in a fantasy world. And because the evidence has been coming in so well, in a recent book, up to 30 million people in North America, England, and Europe have claimed to have near-death experiences. So I could say, hey, some, let's just say the number's blown up too much and there's only 20 million. In a way, that's 20 million people who've been to Narnia. Then, let's go to the land of my brain. You're gonna love this. If you wanna look at it that way. So don't tell me there's no empirical evidence for this. And they'll say, yeah, those are just experiences. You don't have data. Well, you don't say that to me. I, I you know, I just gave, gave a paper yesterday. I, I know of 300 evidenced NDE accounts where what's reported is empirically verified. So. If you can't refute it, and it's almost impossible to refute the, the NDEs, if you can't refute them and you have this alternate reality, in what category? In the category of afterlife. Oh, so there may be an afterlife. Well, I didn't think so until today, but yeah, I guess maybe there is. Okay, now can we talk about resurrection? See, because I've opened the door to talk about this alternate reality, which may last forever, and you can't say anymore, yeah, but you're asking me to believe in Oz, because I would, I would say, I sure am, and I've got data for us. 
So, so this video isn't about near-death experiences. Well, I guess it's about one guy's near-death experience, but it's not about near-death experiences in general. But he is setting up a precedent that we know about supernatural experiences happening today, and we have evidence for those supernatural experiences, so we can't rule out one happening in the first century. So let's talk about near-death experiences. There aren't a lot of of tests out there studying what happens to the brain when it is dying. The problem is that it's hard to predict when somebody is going to die and it's unethical to kill someone for a test. But there are a few studies. So the question is why does that happen? And we don't have the answers because to our scientific model, when people have died, there should be no more conscious awareness going on. Uh, but it sounds like maybe consciousness is able to continue. And by that, I don't mean that they're awake. But that entity that makes us who we are, makes Sam who he is, makes Rena who she is, the self, the mind, seems to continue and doesn't become annihilated after a person has gone through their process of death. From what this case of one tells us, um, we record an activity that is very similar to healthy humans that have undergone experiments and testings, that have done out-of-body experiences, uh, hallucinations, memory flashbacks, all the things that are consistently being described by people who undergo near-death experience, these guys have uh, exhibited these brain waves that exactly the same ones we're measuring when we record the activity of this patient 30 seconds before the heart stops beating and 30 seconds after the heart stops beating. Uh, that we found was quite astonishing. The brain is a very complex biological machine, and there is a lot going on in there. We do have stories of people going to heaven and meeting angels or gods or family members, but they almost always coincide with whatever belief they already had before this near-death experience. This man goes on to tell a few stories that he thinks prove that near-death experiences are a supernatural experience like this one about numbers in a hospital room. Um, this woman has a, uh, she's being operated on. She has a near-death experience. She's up above her body. She's looking down. She's watching herself. And sometimes they don't even know it's them because they identify with who's up by the ceiling. That's their point of consciousness. And on the top of this medical device that was in the room, you know, hospitals often rivet numbers like offices do to keep track of typewriters and to keep track of things. Exactly. Just like the typewriters that we all still have in offices. She looked down and there was a 12 digit number riveted onto the top of this medical thing. And she said, I'm OCD. And so I memorized the 12 digit number. So our soul leaves our body, and not only can we still see things despite being souls, so I guess, yeah, that's fine, souls have eyes, but we also take our brain disorders with us. Even though obsessive compulsive disorder is a physical thing that we inherit genetically, apparently it follows us into the afterlife. As soon as she comes to, she says to the nurse, write this down. Now, I'm not saying this is a number, but it's like, write this down. 675-21-600. 12 numbers. And the nurse wrote it down. And they were later moving the apparatus out of the room. And the nurse jumps in and says, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Let me get my sheet out. Wow, the number's exactly right. Okay, so in the actual story, the nurse never wrote it down. She just brought it up later when they were moving the equipment. She said that it was the same number that a patient said. She never named that patient, and we can only go by that nurse's word. But luckily, they have tried repeating this to see if there's anything to it. They have done many studies where they place images in high shelves and operating rooms so that if somebody does have this experience, they can verify whether or not they actually saw something that was there. And so far, nobody has. But he chooses this one flimsy story over that study. What is happening here is that he is assigning a supernatural meaning to something that we haven't shown to be supernatural, and then he is using that to say that supernatural things happen 
in order to argue for a supposed supernatural event that was supposed to have happened nearly 2,000 years ago. This isn't adding up. That's a bit of a stretch. Next! Paul was in Jerusalem three years after his conversion on the Damascus Road on a fact-finding mission, during which time he conferred with both Peter, Jesus' chief disciple, and James, Jesus' younger brother, over a two-week period of time. And he probably received this uh, tradition at that time, if not before. Now, when you realize that Paul was converted in A.D. 33 and that Jesus was crucified around A.D. 30, that means that this list of witnesses to the post-mortem appearances of Jesus goes back to within the first five years after Jesus' death. As told in the book of Acts, which was written 40 to 60 years later, Paul is said to have been converted a few years after the resurrection, but the story isn't told for decades. Galatians, which is the oldest epistle in the Bible that is attributed to Paul, only mentions Christ's death, and the only time the resurrection is mentioned is the resurrection of all of us at the end of time. And in the foreword that says that Paul wrote it, and he is a servant of the risen Lord which obviously would have been added later. <clears throat> I'm Brick. I was dead last week. And thus it is simply idle to try to dismiss these appearances as mere uh, legends. According to John Dominic Crossan, a very skeptical, uh, radical New Testament critic, who believes that many of the events of the gospel passion narratives were invented on the basis of Old Testament motifs, it would take at least five to ten years for the early church to find the Old Testament motifs to invent the Passion story. And yet you notice that this information about the eyewitnesses to Jesus' resurrection appearances antedates even the lower limit set by Crossan of five years. Yeah, exactly. If legends were written about it, you would expect the different Gospels to have different accounts, like only one of them saying that a bunch of people were raised from the dead, or only one of them saying that there was also a huge earthquake at the time of the resurrection, or only one of them having a story about guards falling to the ground like they were dead, instead of having no guards like the other narratives. Or like if they made up the angels, they would have different accounts. Like one would only have one angel, while another had two. Some would have the angels appearing like lightning before them, while others had the angels already being there when they arrived. Number five is that the written and archaeological sources overwhelmingly, and I use that term, overwhelmingly support the gospel's resurrection narrative. Overwhelmingly? Wow, that's a huge claim. So the narrative, the juridical procedure that we have um, embedded in the Gospels, like you said earlier, hey, I don't trust the Bible. I don't trust the Gospels. Well, let me just leave it here. And by the way, we did an entire top 10 video on archaeology, so you've definitely got to check that one out. So hopefully we'll link to that in this video. Here's what Jody Magnus says. She is an atheist archaeologist who I cite in my book, Body of Proof. She's at University of North Carolina. She's an expert in many of the things we discussed in our Archaeology Top 10 video. And guess what she has to say about the juridical procedure of the Gospels, meaning how did the Gospels describe the trial, the burial, the death, execution, even the resurrection? She doesn't have a dog in the hunt. She's an archaeologist who's an atheist, but she is very well acquainted with archaeology of Jerusalem and the Holy Land Jewish burial traditions. Here's the exact quote. The Gospels get it right. <laughs> so <laughs> recently, fellow Canadian YouTuber Apologia had Jody Magnus on his channel. So I reached out to him and I asked if I could show this clip in response. The Gospels get it right. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> you wrote... The gospel accounts of Jesus' burial appear to be largely consistent with the archaeological evidence. Yes. And also, the gospel accounts describing Jesus' removal from the cross and burial accord well with archaeological evidence and Jewish law. You are oft quoted. Yeah, I, I look, so I just want to clarify. When I say they're consistent with, they are consistent with. Does that prove the historicity of the gospel accounts? It doesn't 
prove that the accounts are historical, but it means that wh whoever wrote those accounts was familiar with how the Jews of Jerusalem disposed of their dead in the time of Jesus. There was a movie that came out a few years ago called Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter. The movie gets a number of things right. His best friend was a guy named Joshua Speed, who worked in a general store. He married Mary Todd, who had previously dated Stephen Douglas. The depiction of the Capitol buildings and house chambers were all very accurate for the time period. Does this then mean that Abraham Lincoln did in fact hunt vampires? As for hostile testimony, or at least not pro-Christian, many outside sources wrote of this Jesus. A worker of wonders did miracles, claimed to be God, crucified at Passover. The core facts of the gospel, death, deity, and resurrection, just based on ancient Jewish, Greek, and Roman sources that certainly were no friend to the burgeoning church. That's very compelling to historians because it represents objectivity, that those no friend of the movement also corroborate the core facts of what we know about Jesus. Oh, that's pretty cool. What are those sources? On a document that yeah. is, in their minds, up for debate. Absolutely. Well, the, the New Testament contains four biographies of Jesus that are historical. That's a weird way to put that. Why is he saying historical and not historically accurate? Is, is that on purpose? So much so that even atheist and agnostic archaeologists in the land of Israel will use Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the Book of Acts, and Josephus to make sure that they're digging in the right spot. So, Alan, if the atheist archaeologists believe that the four biblical gospels are historical, I'm going to use them too. That sounds like a good answer to me. <laughs> you can use fictional works as a reference if they are set in a certain location and written around that time. Non-Christian writers, Romans like Tacitus, early second century, Jews like Josephus at the end of the first century. So we have the Gospels, which were written to try to convince people to join this religion and completely contradict each other on many details. You have Josephus, which many scholars believe that the part about Jesus is a forgery added later by Christians, and Tacitus that was in the second century and acknowledged that there were people who were called Christians. Overwhelming. Nine sources. Number one, the creed that we mentioned earlier. That is, that is a hugely powerful piece of ancient history. So powerful that one of the few Jewish New Testament scholars Pinchus Lapid says, its historical credentials are so good that it may be taken as a statement of eyewitnesses. An early Christian creed is historical evidence of the resurrection? Are you even trying? It's a religious statement of faith and we really don't know how early it is. But even if it was early, it doesn't mean it is true. He then goes on a really long explanation about the gospels and the same two sources that Sean McDowell has and that everybody else has. I think this is why most apologists and most people in my comments just say that there are a bunch of sources and move on. Because once you actually look at what those sources are, you won't be that impressed. You're much better off taking the Frank Turk approach. I get this question a lot. Maybe you do if you're a Christian. Are there any non-Christian writers that talk about Jesus and the apostles? Yeah, there are. They're all in chapter 9 of the book, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. Buy my book if you want those sources so bad. The Christquake shows how Larson's crew found in ground, once covered by the Dead Sea, the geologic ripples of the gigantic earthquake that split rocks at the very hour of Jesus' death. Absolutely. Science is whatever we want it to be. So I sent this clip to a good friend of mine who is a geologist. Her initial thoughts based on what she saw in that clip is that it could be crossbeds from sand depositing in a river, or it could be scratches on the rock from a steel pen. She made a rough guess based on the surrounding rocks, and she thinks that we are probably looking at millions of years ago that these lines were created, if they aren't just scratch marks, and not 2,000 like they are implying. But even if my very smart friend is wrong because I gave her very little time, and even if it is an earthquake from 33 AD, like the graphic says, that does nothing to prove that it was caused by Jesus dying. It just means there was an earthquake. Archaeology gives us more precision with our interpretation, Alan. 
Um, when in the 19th century, when archaeology is just getting started, you go to Jerusalem, the Holy Sepulchre Church. Well, that's inside the city walls. That can't be the right spot because the the Bible, Hebrews and other books say that Jesus was crucified outside the city. Mm-hmm. Well, it was outside the city in the first century. Exactly. Only because of archaeology do we know that Herod Agrippa between AD 41 and 44 expanded the city walls. Originally, the Holy Sepulchre was outside. So you can see why they just didn't know that then. So- a tomb existing does not mean that Jesus was buried there and rose there. Next! If you're an historian and you're trying to understand, is this ancient writer telling me the truth? One of the tests you apply is called the criterion of embarrassment. And what it means is, if this writer is reporting something that hurts their own case or is embarrassing to themselves... It's probably true, because if they're going to make something up, they wouldn't make something up that's going to be embarrassing. They'd make something up, makes themselves look good. New Testament writers, this is true of the Old Testament as well, but the New Testament writers have filled the New Testament with embarrassing stories they never would have invented. That's why we're calling this the duff factor. They're not making this up. Let me just give you a few of these. Notice, the New Testament writers depict themselves as as dim-witted. I mean, they don't even understand Jesus' mission. You're reading through the Gospels, you're going, they're going, we didn't know what Jesus was saying. We didn't know what he was talking about. It's not until he's already resurrected and ascended to heaven do they understand what Jesus really, his mission was. It's only then that they go, wow, I could have had a V8, right? Up to that point, they don't get it. That's embarrassing. Uh, First of all, it's just a classic narrative tool. You have somebody in the story who doesn't know what's going on, so you can explain things to the audience. It's just what stories do. As of today, yes, I made all my videotapes. Explain. Also, it explains the reason why it took so long for people to know this stuff that Jesus was supposed to have taught. It's not that Jesus didn't say this stuff. It's just that those around weren't ready to hear it or weren't ready to understand it. And that's why it didn't spread till now. But the most popular use of the criterion of embarrassment is that women were the first witnesses. It was women who discovered the tomb empty. Well, that is an embarrassing fact for the early church. Why? Because in ancient Jewish and Roman culture, the testimony of women was not considered to be credible. Interesting, though, that so many evangelicals still have so much trouble believing women. They probably would not have mentioned that the women were the first people to see Jesus because the women's testimony of that time wasn't considered as strong as the men's. So the fact that they would insert that um, into the Gospels gives you the idea that these men who wrote this were first and foremost concerned about truth and not just about making themselves look good. Because if I was writing that, I would want to be like, hey, yeah, the guys, the fellas, they were the first people who got to the tomb, right? Because that would have presented, that would have been considered a stronger testimony. Yeah, no, we know. We've seen your videos. You do not like women. The tomb was discovered by women. Now, in that culture, a woman's testimony in most circumstances was considered worthless. They didn't, a woman was not educated in the sense like a man was. So why would the apostles invent that women discovered the empty tomb unless it were really true? But why isn't it the same women in all the accounts? One has the two Marys, one has the two Marys and Salome, one has the two Marys and Joanna, and one just has Mary Magdalene. This also goes back to the idea that these stories of the resurrection grew over time. You needed a reason why people didn't believe it at the time. So you make the witnesses women and say that that's why people didn't believe it. And that's why you are only hearing about it now. You cannot explain the conversion of hostile people like James, his brother, or Saul of Tarsus outside of the resurrection. If you were ever a youth group kid, you know the power of a good testimony. If you had to listen to a testimony and it starts with, I grew up in a Christian home, you knew it was going to be a boring one. The good ones were about sleeping around and doing drugs. Yes, I ran with a bad crowd that taught me to smoke weed and steal. I hung out in bars and I hot-wired cars. I grew up mistreated, 
so I lied and I cheated. So it makes sense that this has always been the case. Either you make it up to get people to listen to you, you embellish your past a bit to make you sound like you were more badass, or the people with that background are the ones who get the speaking roles. They're the ones who rise to the top. Next. Believers were Jewish, and so they began to worship on the first day of the week, that is Sunday, instead of uh, the Sabbath day. They, had, they celebrated the Lord's Supper, which is a proclamation of his death and burial and resurrection until he comes. Ew, who would have sex in this filthy old castle? What? <laughs> Ew, no, no. And baptism, which was a symbol of buried with him in the likeness of his death and raised in the likeness of his resurrection. Let's take a look at the apostles' beliefs and practices before and after the resurrection. Remember, they're all Jews, except for Luke the writers. Before, they believed in animal sacrifice. They've been slaying lambs for hundreds of years. And then suddenly Jesus comes along and they say, we don't need to slay these lambs anymore because here's the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. All these lambs are just symbols of the lamb who is now arrived. Most of the conversions happened after the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, which means that without a temple, no one was doing animal sacrifices. So it's not a stretch that they would include a reason why you wouldn't have to start again if the temple was rebuilt. Five. Before they believed in a binding law of Moses. Afterwards, they say Christ's life has fulfilled the binding law of Moses. They branched out to non-Jewish people immediately. It makes sense that they would strip away some of their old rules in order to gain new followers. Before they believe in strict monotheism. Afterwards, they're believing in a trinity, three persons in one divine essence. Yes, I know you can get the trinity from the Old Testament, but it's much clearer in the new. No, you can't. And no, it isn't. Is he just admitting that the trinity is not monotheism? Because that's what it seems like. Before they believed in the Sabbath, in fact, they thought they could be stoned for not obeying the Sabbath. Why is he wording it that way? Probably because the Bible does say that you should be stoned for not honoring the Sabbath. But that also makes the Bible sound bad. And he wants to hold on to the Bible, so he words it in a way that says they thought they could be stoned. So he makes it so that the way that they understood that very clear text uh, was just a misunderstanding. Afterwards, they're worshiping on Sunday, the day Jesus rose, and Paul even says in Colossians chapter 2, don't let anyone tell you you have to obey any Sabbath or festival day. Why would he say such a thing? Because what did the Sabbath represent? The Sabbath represented rest, and the rest has arrived. Or that Christians would still meet at the synagogue on Saturday because they still consider themselves to also be Jewish, so they needed another day to meet with their new Christian friends. And then later, when they spread out to the Gentiles, they just picked one of the two, probably the one that allowed them to still go to synagogue if they wanted to. Jesus is our rest. We rest in his work, not our own. In fact, out of the Ten Commandments, nine of them are repeated in the New Testament, which is the only one not repeated in the New Testament. Keep holy the Sabbath. Before they believed in a conquering Messiah, afterwards they believed in a sacrificial Messiah. Because Jesus didn't fulfill prophecy. I would move past that one quickly if I were you. Before they believed in circumcision, afterwards they believed in baptism and communion. Both of these guys act like baptism was invented by Christians, but if that was the case, you would think that John the Baptist makes no sense at all in the Bible, and that Jesus getting baptized in a public place where other baptisms were happening would make no sense. It comes from a practice of ritual washing that converts to Judaism would have been doing for centuries. And the circumcision thing only stopped in the Bible for non-Jewish converts. Besides, if given the chance, I think most people, if they see an opportunity to make it so you don't have to cut part of your penis off, you take that opportunity. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what would cause these pious Jews 
who thought they were God's chosen people and didn't think a man could claim to be God, that would be blasphemy, didn't think there'd be a resurrection in the middle of time, but only at the end, what would cause them to abandon everything on the left and adopt everything on the right virtually overnight? The only thing I can think of is what psychologists call an impact event. What's an impact event? An impact event is an event that occurs in your life that is so impactful, so dramatic, that it can turn your worldview around 180 degrees. Changing religious practices isn't evidence that something supernatural happened. This all just seems to signify a cultural shift in who was following that religion. It's not that deep. Next! But we, it is an unimpeachable fact of history that everywhere the gospel goes, it seems to bring freedom and equality with it. Are you serious? Are you serious? <laughs> Are you serious? Are you serious? Are you serious? Are you serious? Seriously? Are you serious? Are you serious? Are you serious? Seriously? Seriously? Are you serious? Not perfection. There hasn't been, that doesn't mean that it's always been done perfectly. But friends, I have written an extensive book on this subject that this world would be a far different place had Christianity never existed. I mean, yeah, it would be a different place. That is for sure. Uganda now has the death penalty for being gay because of Christian missionaries. Historically, Christians have killed and tortured in the name of converting people. Christianity regularly restricts women's rights. Christianity has been fighting against scientific study and advancements for centuries, and it has destroyed art and cultures because it deemed it sacrilegious. It has forced our First Nation children into residential schools here in Canada so that they could uh, go all genocidal on their culture. So, like, what in the actual what are you talking about? Next. Chicken next. Not only was Jesus' tomb discovered empty, but over a period of time, Jesus appears alive in a dozen different instances to more than 515 people, to skeptics and doubters, as well as to believers, indoors, outdoors, groups, to individuals, daytime, nighttime. Um, people talk with them, they touched him, they ate with them. Okay, so we have discussed this one so many times. He has appeared to all those people in a story we don't have independent sources of these things. It's the same reason we don't believe that a T-Rex ran down a city street despite all these witnesses. But okay, so where are we at now? If I were to take all the arguments I've heard here and decide whether or not the resurrection is definitely guilty of happening, I wouldn't just say that they haven't shown it beyond a reasonable doubt. I would say that they haven't shown it at all. And I know, I know, I cherry-picked. I picked the most easy ones to debunk. No. <laughs> if anything, I only cut out the ones that were really, really stupid. But if you have one that you think proves it, of course put it in the comments. But it seems to me that the claims boil down to this. Some people knew about an empty tomb. Ooh, okay, okay, they bought it, they bought it. Some people really believed that Jesus rose. Some of those people died. Some of those people wrote about what they believed happened. Some people wrote about those people who believed that it happened. Some people changed their religion. People used to hate women. Used to. I said he used to be a piece of shit. It's the best answer to explain why the world is so great, but also why it's not that great. I'm not convinced by these arguments. The slightest bit of critical thinking shows how weak and meaningless all these arguments are. But maybe I'm the odd one out, and everyone who watched this now believes, and I just started a brand new revival. But the fact is that a lot of people live in communities or families where they don't feel like they can question things. They are seen as rebellious or angry or even evil for even questioning this narrative. And I really, really wish that wasn't a factor when it came to accepting the reality of how the world actually functions and what is actually truth. Thank you so much for making it this far. If you know somebody who may benefit from watching it, send it their way. I think you are all wonderful, and I love you so much. Bye. Work, 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 Sky Moon. <laughs> <laughs>